When we capture CO2 at an emission source, it needs to be transported to a storage location. That is Bayrek Dolek's job as a shipping commercial manager at Northern Lights, the world's first open source CCS site or CO2 storage site. Transporting CO2 by ship enables flexible infrastructure, but innovative solutions are needed to handle the CO2 in a safe and efficient way. Boris is here to explain you all about it. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Evin. So this presentation is about shipping of CO2, but I'll start with um, a few words on Norton Lights first. Norton Lights is a joint venture of Equinor, Shell and Total. Um, on the slide, you can see the value chain we are trying to establish. On the left-hand side, you see the industrial CO2 emission sites, our potential customers. Uh, we expect the customers to capture the CO2, purify it, liquefy it, and bring it available at the shore side. The purple frame shows our service of, uh, scope of services. We come to the shore with our ships, we transport the CO2 to the western coast of Norway, unload it temporarily to increase the pressure and pump it through a 100 kilometer pipeline, then three kilometers, almost three kilometers underground. We are building our uh, infrastructure. We started about a year ago, the construction. On the left-hand side, you can see the artist's impression of how it will look like once it's complete. On the right-hand side, you can see a recent photo from the onshore terminal. Uh, the last year, this uh, 2021, uh, has been very busy with blasting, leveling the sites. Very busy sites. Uh, we had lots of guests. And we prepared uh, the site for phase one on the left-hand side and also phase two expansion as well on the right-hand side. Uh, here you can see on the demonstration, uh, on the artist's impression, um, the jetty uh, construction has begun. We are building two ships initially. And uh, also the installation of the uh, storage and pumping facilities will commence in a few months, in 2022. Uh, let's talk about shipping, why we need CO2 shipping first. Uh, you see a map of Europe, but the story applies to many uh, clusters, regions around the world. Certain geographies are really good for CO2 sequestration, underground storage. But CCS is most cost-effective when it's done from a point source, industrial uh, CO2 emission source. And when you look around the world, where CO2 can be stored underground and where CO2 is emitted en masse, is often not overlapping. There are a few exceptions. For example, in the UK, there are some clusters we see. Netherlands may be an exception that certain areas are not too far from where you can store the CO2 and where it's emitted. But most areas and most customers, industrial customers, are far away uh, from, uh, from uh, where CO2 can be stored underground. Then, we need to, for CCS to work, we need to transport the CO2 to where it can be stored. One can argue that why don't we build pipelines everywhere? That's one sort of transporting CO2. But for a pipeline to be cost competitive compared to shipping, it needs to meet, uh, broadly speaking, three criteria at the same time. The volume of CO2 needs to be more than 5 million tons per annum. The distance needs to be less than 500 kilometers. And such a project, given that pipeline is a fixed investment that you cannot move, has to be longer than 20 years commitments on, in all aspects. And if you look again, industrial sites, uh, the potential flows of CO2, most flows do not meet this criteria. So shipping is much more cost efficient than pipeline transportation. Then what are the advantages of shipping compared to pipeline? It's, uh, it enables CO2 flows of less than 5 mTPA, million tons per annum, from point sources, but even enables much smaller uh, industrial sites, such as less than 400 kilotons per annum, to become a part of the CCA, CCS um, environment. Longer distance 
sites can feasibly, relatively cost efficiently, can transport the CO2 using ships instead of pipelines. Given that ships are um, uh, flexible, not like a pipeline, the commitment terms commercially could be less than 20 years, 10 years, 15 years. And if a uh, deal is uh, over after 10 years, you can deploy the ship elsewhere. So it enables shorter term deals. And eventually, uh, fleet optimization, network effects, redundancy and flexibility. If you have a fleet of ships that you commercially control, unlike a pipeline, when it's down, the whole value chain is down. Ships you can flexibly deploy elsewhere and benefit from the network effects and offer a higher level of service, more efficiency, and more redundancy. As I mentioned before, we are building two ships initially. The two ships we are building are, uh, will be the largest CO2 carriers in the world. Today, there are just a handful of um, very small uh, CO2 carriers. There are about 1,000 cubic meters of uh, capacity each, the existing ships, versus the ships we will build are 7,500 cubic meters, significantly larger. In global shipping sense, one could deem these ships still uh, as relatively small-scale ships. Uh, so the, uh, but, uh, of course, as the CO2 uh, shipping and the market grows, uh, the shipping capacities will uh, expand with the market over time. We expect the ships to be delivered in the first half of 2024, and we expect to start our operations end-to-end -end in 2024. Um, the ships that we are building will be operating what we call at medium pressure regime, around 15 bar pressure and uh, minus 26 degrees Celsius temperature. So CO2 shipping is a new um, segment, we could say. There are only a handful of ships, and this could become significantly uh, bigger than that. How do we make sure that shipping is, in a way, standardized, compatible, so that we get that network effect? Um, so, uh, so different ships can call at different ports, and, uh, and there's redundancy in the system. We don't have to uh, worry too much about regulations uh, and rules. International shipping rules and regulations either directly already cater for CO2 shipping or using liquefied gas transportation rules, such as IGC codes, ISO rules, CICTO rules and regulations, we can just uh, follow these existing rules and regulations and make the CO2 ships in a way compatible uh, with each other. But if you talk about CO2, itself, um, we could also look at uh, some other aspects. One of them is the CO2's composition, the cargo's composition. The other one is the temperature and pressure of the CO2. When we talk about shipping worlds, shipping of CO2, um, there are three different pressure and temperature regimes emerging at the moment. Medium pressure, low pressure, and high pressure. As um, Northern Lights, we have selected medium pressure for our phase one. Uh, and although we have not taken final investment decision yet, we will most likely stay at um, medium pressure regime in phase two as well, which is up to five million tons per annum. Uh, so here, I would like to take a few minutes really on uh, different pressure regimes and how this may pan out over time. Maybe perhaps we can use an analogy of today's LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, shipping as um, an example. It is very similar to CO2 in a way that it's also uh, cold and uh, pressurized cargo. Today, if you look at LPG shipping, uh, we see three different shipping segments. Uh, fully pressurized, relatively smaller ships, semi-refrigerated, medium size, and finally, uh, fully refrigerated, much larger ships. So one could easily um, extrapolate and envisage that CO2 shipping will be in a way similar. We may see um, potentially two, maybe three different segments. Um, we see that medium pressure is end-to-end -end most economical for up to 3 million tons per annum of flow between ports A and B, back and forth, 3 million tons per annum. And the ships uh, up to 15,000 cubic meters uh, would be most economical uh, using medium pressure. Often, when we talk about millions and millions of tons of CO2 that needs to be moved, uh, most people immediately jump into the conclusion 
that's okay, we have to immediately scale up to a much larger ship size. But if you look at potential customers, industrial sites, we see, broadly speaking, again, two different types of customers. Some of them are uh, at a standalone location, relatively small volume, maybe half a million tons per annum to one or two million tons per annum. Or we see hubs, industrial lots of sites together, but again, those hubs, most of them will start by one uh, industrial site going first, and the second one follows with CCS, a third one, so it will be a gradual uh, development. That, that means that CO2 shipping also needs to follow the market, and uh, it's not going to start with more than 3 million tons per annum one site immediately, it's going to start with maybe half a million, one million ton, and then gradually build up if it's a hub location, or maybe stay at that level from an AB perspective. So we see medium pressure playing a big role initially in establishing a shipping market uh, in CO2. Over time, as the clusters form and multiple industrial sites all start with CCS, when that hub, that cluster, becomes more than 3 million tons per annum, perhaps low pressure will start in, uh, that may happen in 2029-30 with the ships being delivered. And gradually, we can see two segments working side by side, medium pressure doing certain volume and lo low pressure, um, larger ships uh, doing a different type of volume. Um, one thing to highlight here is, as you can see, medium pressure, low pressure, high pressure is all about pressure. CO2 is different than miniature liquefied gas cargoes, different than LNG, different than LPG in the sense that other cargoes, you can just cool them down and bring the pressure to almost atmospheric pressure. That allows for other cargoes, not CO2, to expand the storage capacity. Because it's at or close to atmospheric pressure, you can build much larger uh, CO2 tanks. But if you look at CO2 phase diagram, CO2 has this triple point where uh, liquid can easily turn to dry ice, solid, and that's around six bar. So CO2 has to be kept always under pressure and above around six bar pressure to keep it in liquid form and not allow dry, dry ice formation. So this dry ice formation is a potential technical risk that ships and all the end-to-end -end value chain with so many instrumentation, measuring quantity, quality, and so forth, uh, if the CO2 is not well managed and a dry ice formation is uh, allowed in a way, uh, unexpectedly, it could damage the instrumentation. So uh, being close to six bar uh, would create some technical challenges. Working in medium pressure, far away from the triple point at 15 bar or so, uh, is a much easier place to manage the CO2, comfortably within liquid form with only vapor uh, in balance, of course. So low pressure ships, as they develop, larger ships in the future also need to really carefully manage the CO2 uh, to not let them go into dry ice space. When we come to composition of CO2, um, CO2 needs to be very close to pure CO2. Uh, this is a whole topic of presentation itself, but in a nutshell, um, as we discussed, uh, as you introduce impurities into CO2, that dry ice formation and CO2 uh, going between different phases may become a risk. So that needs to be managed, but also impurities may cause health hazards in the unexpected, uh, in a way, emergency venting of the CO2. But most importantly, uh, throughout the value chain, CO2 mixed with likes of water, likes of oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, uh, it can create corrosion. Uh, the pipelines involved uh, in the end-to-end -end value chain, for example, the pipeline that we are building, uh, the 100 kilometers from, uh, from Norway to offshore North Sea, uh, is carbon steel. So it needs to be, uh, the CO2 composition needs to be carefully managed that uh, uh, the CO2 flow is not uh, corrosive to the pipeline. So this is how the CO2 shipping uh, network could look like uh, in 2030. Uh, in North, Northwest Europe. Uh, so potentially a significant volume flow with different storage sites around North Sea backing each other up and creating a network effect. Uh, I think it's, it's, it can uh, go to a nice place. I would like to end this presentation with some um, uh, figures so, uh, from different sources. The first one is that according to um, IEA, Following their sustainable development scenario, CCS needs to reach more than 10 gigatons per annum by 2070s. In the next 50 years, 
it has to reach more than 10 gigatons per annum. Another figure is that today, uh, large industrial installations in Europe emits over 1.3 gigatons uh, per annum of CO2. I'm not claiming that all of this will be under CCS, and not all of them will be under CO2 shipping, of course, but significant CO2 emissions uh, by industrial sites in Europe. Compare that amount of CO2 from the first two bullet points to the third one. The global seaborne train today is estimated to be around 11 gigatons per annum. So, uh, although shipping is very large around the world, the CO2 that needs to be transported on ships is also significant. So I think we are at the dawn of an industrial, uh, dawn of a, a new, uh, new CO2 shipping segment being born. Uh, so we will see, in my view, many, many CO2 ships uh, in the coming decade and decades. I would like to wrap up. Thank you very much, Boris. Thanks. I have gotten a question online. Uh, first from uh, Jürgen Ugru. So you can, if you can please come back on the stage. Um, Jürgen Ugru asks, will Northern Lights operate the ships themselves or enter a contract with a ship management company? Uh, we will uh, work with a reputable ship management company. We will tender. Thank you very much. Thanks. And also, Ryan, uh, Hobala has a question, if that's okay, Boris. How much CO2 will Northern Lights transport ships emit? Have you thought about that? Like yes, yes. The whole uh, I LCA can try bit? to answer, absolutely. Good question. For us, um, of course, storing CO2 permanently, uh, having a low uh, emission is very important. Uh, our ships uh, will be running on LNG, which is one of the cleanest burning fuels today available. Uh, our ships will also have air lubrication, which is air bubbles under the ship to reduce the drag of the ships, and a rotor sail using the wind as the propulsion as well. Also, we'll have shaft generator, which is effectively recycling the uh, rotational power to create electricity as well. With all of that, they will reduce the ships themselves, will reduce their emissions by 30% compared to traditional ships of uh, the same segment. We expect that the shipping uh, emissions itself to be less than 2% of the overall CO2 carried. Uh, of course, our aspiration is to reduce this significantly and maybe for future ships uh, move to net zero uh, fuels as they become available. Thank you very much. Thanks. And a final question. Yeah, sure. Maybe you don't want to answer, but the question is, of course, uh, how much does it cost? So I guess it depends a lot of where you uh, collect it and how long it needs to be transported and what ship, and, and th there are probably several factors in there. But what, what can you say about the uh, cost of uh, transporting CO2 by ships? won't be able to reveal the figure here. Uh, as you highlighted, it depends. Uh, but also um, how efficiently the ships used uh, makes a difference as well. It's not just the ship's price. Of course, shorter distances uh, are enable ship to be utilized much more efficiently, but also lack of seasonality. If the CO2 emission is seasonal and there's a uh, lower uh, a time, the ship utilization may fall. So flat C CO2 utilization uh, would uh, also increase the efficiency of the ships and lower the unit's shipping cost. Thank you so Thanks. much. Highly appreciated. Pleasure.